Well, good morning and welcome to another broadcast from Christ United Reformed Church. Um, once again, I'm Pastor Godfrey, alone in the building and missing all of you very much. Uh, I very much wish that we could all be together and opening God's Word together. And so, uh, once again, this is a week where I feel somewhat torn, uh, thankful to God, certainly, that we are still able to meet via video conference and uh, still lamenting that we are separated from one another. Um, I especially miss uh, seeing you boys and girls, hearing you pray with us in the services, and so I hope you're doing well too, um, and I pray that by God's grace we might be granted the opportunity to gather together in person once again very soon. Um, I continue to hope and pray that if you have any needs, you'll reach out to uh, myself or one of the other uh, officers of the church that we might meet those needs. We're certainly praying for you, endeavoring to uh, minister to you throughout the week by also making uh, devotional videos available uh, so we can have some measure of contact yet with one another. Um, and we're continuing to meet as officers of the church in our regular meetings and talking about what we might do to better serve you um, in this time of lockdown. So uh, we don't know how much longer we're going to be uh, in this situation. We certainly hope that uh, there's already talk of opening up in some respects. And so we are encouraged to hear that and definitely hope that the Lord would open the doors for the churches once again, uh, but that as they remain closed, we're thankful to know that the gospel is not bound. And hopefully you've been encouraged as I have been uh, to be able to open up social media and, and see nothing but church services, devotionals, all kinds of things. And so um, if, if through this lockdown, one person who did not know the gospel is seen or come into contact with the preaching of the word and come to faith in Jesus Christ, I think we'd all grant that this has been worth it. Um, certainly keep you in our prayers and I'm glad to have this time with you to particularly on the Lord's Day that he's made for our rest and for his worship to gather together and to worship the name of our God together. And so our God calls us to worship this morning from these words from Psalm 148 verses 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Well, people of God, our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. And he greets us once again this morning with these words from 1 Timothy 1, verse 2. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you join me in praying that God would bless our time together as we enter into his word? Let's pray. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, our desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the gracious power of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, again, one of the things that we need to do on a regular basis is to uh, look to God's law and to hear from his law, to hear his will for our lives, and to hold up that will for us as a mirror to our own lives to see how our lives measure up to his law and to be reminded once again of how much we need the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the law this morning comes from the same summary of the law that our Lord gave in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31, that it came up in the context of a dispute he was having over, over the law with the teachers of the law. And we read in Mark chapter 12, and one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And so Jesus taught us that that is the will of God for our lives. And it's a wonderful will, isn't it? His, his will is good and pleasing and perfect, that we would love him and that we would love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Uh, but as we look at our lives in comparison to that law, we see how far short we fall of the standard we hear. That although we have this good and pleasing and perfect will, we recognize that we have not walked in the ways of this law. That although the law is lovely, we have not walked in a lovely way. Uh, that we have failed to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. In fact, we've loved other things in place of him. 
And we've certainly not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In fact, when we look at our lives, we've turned that dynamic completely upside down. We give thought to ourselves first, then maybe to our neighbors, and finally to our God. And when God's law confronts us in our sin, it does not leave us in despair, but calls us to, to remind us that none of us can stand before a holy God on the basis of our own work. And it doesn't matter how much we like to talk about that work being righteousness infused or grace filled, if any of it depends on us, if any of it is down to our merit or working, then we will fall short of the glory that God demands. Um, and it's not on any fault of his or on the fault of his law. The fault will all be ours for having been unloving people. Um, and so there's no hope in ourselves to come before a living God, but we, again, should not despair because God has provided a remedy in his own beloved son. He's provided the righteousness that we could not work ourselves and asks only that people repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so we want to repent of our sins together. And we'll do so using our prayer of confession. Let's pray together. Eternal and almighty Father, to you belong righteousness, mercy, and forgiveness. But to us belongs open shame, for we are miserable sinners. We are conceived and born in sin. We are prone to do evil and incapable of any good. We have grievously sinned against all of your commandments. We have never kept any of them. By your righteous judgment, we deserve ruin and condemnation. We are grieved that we have offended you. We condemn ourselves and our sins with true repentance, and we seek your grace to relieve our distress. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. For with you there is steadfast love, and with you there is plentiful redemption. Redeem us from all our iniquities for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Work in us that godly sorrow for sin that produces repentance and leads to salvation without regret. Mortify our sins, strengthen our faith, and produce in us the fruit of the Spirit, which is pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. But not only do we need to be re reminded of our sin and our need for a Savior, we also need to be reminded of God's assurance of pardon, that he will certainly forgive those who seek his face in true repentance and faith. And our assurance of pardon this morning comes from Romans chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. We have that wonderful reminder from Romans 4 that righteousness does not come to us from works. It comes to us by the free gift of our God. And that those who are forgiven are blessed. Now that's what our God wants us to understand. That if we put our faith and trust in Christ, we've repented of our sins, then we can be assured that we are not condemned, but that we are blessed that we receive gracious forgiveness full and free from the throne of our Father in heaven on account of the work of Jesus Christ by the application of his spirit. And so if you believe that Jesus Christ, by his perfect life and sacrificial death, the glorious resurrection, has fully atoned for all your sins and satisfied the wrath of God, of God towards you, then I can assure you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority of his word, that your sins are forgiven you and you are not under the condemnation of God. We need to hear that rich word of grace. Let's meditate on it and on the thanksgiving we have as we go before our God in a time of congregational prayer together. Let's pray. Almighty and merciful God, in your fatherly goodness, you have adopted us in Christ and delight to hear our prayers. Therefore, we look to no other king and seek no other advocate for the help that we need in this world. You call us to seek not only our own salvation and good, but that of your whole church and the world, 
and we do so now. We pray especially for your blessing on your holy gospel, that it may be faithfully proclaimed in the world filled with the knowledge of your truth. To that end, please send workers into your field to plant, water, and harvest the people for your name. We pray particularly for the URC missionaries who labor around the world, who labor at home, and who labor abroad. But frustrate the work of those who would sow weeds of heresy and discord. Pull down all the strongholds of Satan in this world and establish your kingdom throughout the earth. Please give fatherly comfort to your servants who suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel and strengthen them in mind and body by your Holy Spirit. We pray also for our governing authorities. May they govern us with wisdom and integrity. Give them a restraining fear of you to keep them from abusing authority and give them the knowledge that they stand under your final judgment. We ask you would use them to contribute to the advancement of a society that is pleasing to you. May they restrain wickedness and vice and promote justice and virtue. And help us that in our worldly callings we may contribute to the good of our neighbors and live peaceable lives in all godliness and honor. We remember also all who suffer from physical dangers, temptation, doubts, illnesses of mind or body, financial distress, and especially those who are near death. We pray that you would comfort all who mourn, particularly all widows and orphans, and be to them a father. Would you show mercy to prisoners, to those in the military or those whose businesses take them great distances? Guard their families and bring them back safely, we pray. May the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, your son, refresh your people in their trials and give them the grace to bear the difficulties you send them for their good. Give us also the grace to share in their suffering and to provide for their needs as we are able. And now as we turn and open your word, we ask that you would strengthen us through it, through your word and through your spirit, that we may worship you not only with our words, but also with our lives. And so build us up into one body, a city in the world whose light cannot be hidden. And above all, we ask not that our will, but your will would be done. And that you would hear our prayers, for we ask them in Jesus' precious name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we gather around God's word, I'd like for you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And we're going to read the first 15 verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and consider them together. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, and let's pay careful attention for this is God's own word. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. 
Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Uh, someone asked me what I was going to be preaching on this week, and I, I said, I'm going to be preaching from Ecclesiastes. And they said, oh, well, that'll be cheery for your congregation. I thought, now come on, Ecclesiastes doesn't have to be uh, dour and, and sad. Ecclesiastes can be encouraging to us. And, and my mind went to this passage because we are keenly aware of our time right now. Um, I keep hearing it in, in jokes and the way people just sort of express things. But, you know, I, I heard someone joke, well, you know, this year, February had 29 days. March, I think, had 100 days. And it feels like April has 1,500 days. Um, I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, variations on that kind of joke, sort of bringing forth the fact that we feel like time is particularly dragging on in this quarantine. Um, I saw also a, a morning news show joke where the person said, you know, I'm having track keeping I'm having trouble keeping track of what day it is. And so they had a segment on the morning show. What day is it? And the anchor at the desk said, well, let's go over to our reporter. What day is it? He was just standing in front of a big screen that said Monday. And he just said, it's Monday. Um, and and maybe, all, maybe you feel like that, that the days are bleeding together and that uh, time is dragging on. And we have questions about time. How long will we still be under these kind of strictures? When will we be able to gather together as the people of God? When will we be able to go about uh, normal life as we knew it um, just a few weeks ago? And so when time is on our minds, I think it's good for us to go and to listen to what God's word has to say about time. Um, and this might be a, a really famous passage um, on our time uh, that, that God's word reflects on. Maybe it's one of the most Famous because it's entered into popular culture uh, through uh, Pete Seeger and the Birds, uh, that song Turn, Turn, which recounts a lot of these opening verses of Ecclesiastes. Time is on our minds, and so it's good to turn to God's word and to reflect on what time is it? How are we to think about our times in the light of God's work and our work in the world? Um, and I, I particularly like this passage because I think it brings out three important things about living life, living life in our times. Um, and, and wisdom literature is, is meant to be helpful for living life. Um, and as I think we look at its reflection on time, we can see uh, three aspects of what it has to teach us about time. First, it has to teach us about the reality of our times. Um, important things to remember about the reality of our times. Then I think it addresses squarely the riddle of our times. Uh, what, what makes it hard to live in the light of that reality? Um, and then finally, we want to reflect on the response to our times. How do we live in light of what we understand, both the reality and the riddle? Um, and so that's what I want to think about together. The reality of our time, the riddle of our time, and the response to our time. Um, how, do we, how do we think about the reality of our times? Um, wisdom literature is very interesting. Um, wisdom literature is very much calculated to help us live life well. Um, that's, the, that's the point of wisdom literature. And this is Ecclesiastes. This is wisdom literature. It's meant to help us learn important things about life. Um, that's, that's what all of the wisdom literature is intended to do. And that's important for us because so much of life comes down to wisdom, doesn't it? Um, there are clear, bright lines that God gives us in terms of his law that serve as guardrails for living life. If you go this far, you're off the road that God wants. If you go this far, you're off the road this way. And so there are, there are, there are guardrails that God has put in this world that you may not transgress. But, in, but how to live in between those rails on the path is often down to wisdom. And the Bible treats wisdom in, in different ways. Uh, we can think of the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. Uh, and think about how it talks and see how different it is than the book of Job and how the book of Job talks and, and the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, one of the images I like that one scholar used of wisdom literature is, you know, Proverbs looks like a nice, pristine house. 
It's, it's a mansion that's well built. And, and Proverbs tells the usual tale, right? That the usual things that if you, if you manage life and live it well, good things happen. That's the general wisdom of the world. And so if we want to think of Proverbs as a picture, it's this beautiful, pristine house, how to live a well-regulated life. Right, and then you might say the next door to it is a house that's completely fallen down. Um, and, and that's the wisdom from the book of Job. What, how do we live when everything has collapsed? Uh, and that's a very important part of living life too, right? Um, and so if, if Proverbs is the, is the well-built house standing there in all its glory, and Job is the house that's fallen down, and how to understand that, then, then what is Ecclesiastes? And I like this author said, well, Ecclesiastes is the house that's still standing, but you can see the signs of age and decay. It's still a glorious house, but maybe there's paint chipping. Maybe you notice some cobwebs in the corner. Um, that, that oftentimes the wisdom of Ecclesiastes comes along to the wisdom of Proverbs and says, yes, but not always or not in every respect, or yes, it's good to toil and, and to earn your money, but you can work too hard. And maybe that's why we don't like Ecclesiastes, because Ecclesiastes always seems to be hedging bets. Yes, that's true, but you know, yes, the wise man saved the city by his wisdom, but no one remembered him. Um, and that's why Ecclesiastes often is wrestling with the brevity and the futility of life in this world. And so as we live life, all of those different perspectives on wisdom are important. But maybe that's why we struggle with Ecclesiastes. We like the yes of Proverbs, not maybe the yes but of Ecclesiastes. Uh, but Ecclesiastes is very important for helping us to understand wisdom for applying our lives. And one of the things that it has to teach us and important things about is the reality of our times. How do we look at the times in which we live? Um, and the principle of time is really stated very clearly um, in verse 1 of Ecclesiastes 3. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Um, this is a very, very easy to state principle of time. Everything has its time. Right? Everything has its time. And I think there are really two aspects to this way of reflecting on the principle of the reality of our times. Everything has a time. Everything has an actual time. Everything has an actual time in which it happens. Uh, maybe we could think of childbirth to see how, how there's a time for everything. Each one of us has a birthday. Uh, boys and girls, you know probably what your birthday is. Uh, when I ask you how many years old are you, you can probably tell me. Um, and, and some of you know when your next birthday is. You're counting the days or you're counting the months till your next birthday. And because all of us have a birthday, we, all of us have a day we were born. It was the actual time appointed for our birth. Right? And so we, we read about that in the Psalm. Psalm 139, 16 says of our lives, In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God appoints a time for everything to happen. And, and that, that time was written down. The actual time of our birth was in God's plan from the beginning. That he had planned not only the day we were born, but all the days of our lives. Those are, those are actually planned. And so everything in this life, birth and everything else, has a, an actual time that's ordained by God. What this passage is teaching us is not only does everything have its actual time that it takes place, but it all has its appropriate time. So again, if we think back to, to our birth, right, that there's, there's a time to be born in a sense, a time appointed, the actual day of your birth, but we know that there's also an appropriate time to be born. If, if a child is born too soon, they're born premature. They can have complications that maybe need they need to stay in the hospital for a time because they're they're premature they were born before the time um, if, if time goes on too long they may induce labor labor for the safety of the child and the mother because there's an appropriate time to be born and that's the that's really the principle of time that ecclesiastes is teaching us there's an actual time when things happen and there's an appropriate time for things to happen. That's, that's the reality of our, of our times. 
And it captures that in terms of all of human life. Right? There, there is a t- for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. There's an actual time and an appropriate time. A time to be born and a time to die. There at the very, very beginning it, it lays out those two, those two ultimate signposts on the life of a human being. The time we enter in this world and the time we leave this world. Uh, and it's it's the teacher's way, of, it's the preacher's way of saying here, um, there's a time to begin life and there's a time to end life. And by connection, there's a time for everything in between those two times. You notice how he begins by saying there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. And then lists all the things that we do in those in-between times. In those times bef- after birth and before death. All of those things that, that human beings have been given to be engaged in. Um, everything between our birth and our death has its actual time and its appropriate time. The time we do things and the time we should do things. And of course, all of these times are contemplated in, in more of, a, of the context of the time in which the preacher here is writing. Um, but all of those things pertain still to human life today, our work, right? So there's farming, a time to plant and a time to pluck up. Uh, There's a shepherding metaphor. That's what's meant here by a time to kill and a time to heal. There's time to slaughter animals and there are times to to heal the animals you have. Um, It deals with construction. There's a time to break down and build up, to gather stones or to scatter stones. Uh, There's a proper time for our feelings in this life, both public and private. Times to weep and times to mourn, times to laugh and times to dance. There's time for our possessions and for our ambitions. There's time to seek and time to give up, time to keep and time to cast away, um, time to tear and time to sow. Uh, There are all those times in the life of our possessions and our ambitions, and there are times for our relationships, to embrace or not to embrace. We're dealing with that in the age of coronavirus, aren't we? It's a time not to embrace, uh, to maintain social distancing. But this is talking about our relationships, a time to embrace and a time not to embrace. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. All of life in between birth and death, those times that have an actual and appropriate time. Um, Everything in between has its actual and appropriate time. That's the reality of living life in this world. And and what was true for us, it was true for Jesus Christ. Uh, He entered into this kind of life. Uh, This kind of life that's lived in time. That was not something that God dwells in in eternity, right? The the Lord is above time. He transcends time. He's outside of time. But when the Lord Jesus Christ enters into the world, he enters into time and history. He, He enters into this experience that all of us are engaged in. This world that has a time for everything. A time for every season and every matter under heaven. And our Lord Jesus Christ came to live between those times of birth and death. And we're reminded in God's word, aren't we, that he he entered the world at just the right time and he left the world at just the right time. Galatians 4 that we considered recently, uh, when was Jesus born? Well, he was born when the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. There was a time appointed for Jesus. And when Jesus came, he came at just the right time, at the fullness of time. Interestingly, the Bible also tells us that he died at just the right time. Um, Think of Romans 5, verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Uh, there, there's, an, a, there's a time appointed for everything under heaven, a time, and a time to die. And that was true for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came at just the right time. He came into the world at just the right time. He left the world by his death at just the right time. And what did all of this accomplish? It accomplished God's plan for time. Everything that Jesus did in his living and his dying and everything in between was just at the right time. Uh, for God's people. And what did his life accomplish between his life and his death? 
Well, we read that in Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, there's an actual and appropriate time for everything that happens under the sun, even our salvation. Jesus entered into this experience, the reality of time, a time to be born and a time to die and a time to do everything in between. He enters into that reality. He knows what it is to live between the times, and that's important for us to understand. That he under, understands our reality. He's lived life in this world uh, with all the ways that it challenges us. Because it's one thing to state the reality of time as Ecclesiastes runs through it here. Um, but the challenge or the riddle of our times is to know what time it is for us. Right? It's one thing to say everything has its actual and appropriate time. It's another thing to say, are, am I living in the, in the actual time where this should be happening? Or am I living in the appropriate time that this should be happening? And how should I think about life under the sun? Because as we run through these things and as we think about the, the day of appointment for all of these things, um, the, the, all, the, the time for everything, a time appointed by God when it ought to happen, a time when it actually will happen, the more we think about that reality, it poses a riddle for us. Um, after reflecting on all of those things, what is the conclusion that's reached in verse 9? What gain has the worker from his toil? Um, and the riddle is really wrestling with the fact how, how little control we have over what time it is. Right? And, that, and that's, what, that, that's what has led some people to become fatalistic about life in this world. And to kind of embrace the reality of time that Ecclesiastes expresses, but to do it in a fatalistic way, a way that basically says, look, if everything has its appointed time and I can't control what time it is, then what does it matter what I do? Right? What if, what if today it's a time not to plant but to pluck up and I'm trying to plant? Does that mean I, I'm doomed to frustration? What, what if I'm to, doing the thing that's, that's not right for the time? What if God hasn't appointed this to be a time for planting and I'm trying to plant anyway? What, what good is my labor if, if now is not the time and I don't know what the time is? How do I live life in this world? You can see how someone could give in to fatalism in this way. And say, you know, what, what good is my work if I don't know what's going to happen? What good is my work if I, if I plant my crops in the season, I do my appropriate work, and a swarm of locusts come through and eat the whole thing up? You know, what if I've labored diligently to have a good job and be responsible with my finances, and suddenly it's a time of coronavirus, and I watch those savings diminish, and the job that I had I can't go into, and things are becoming difficult. What, what gain do I have from my toil? How am I in control of anything? You know, why should I try to be healthy or exercise if I might just die tomorrow? You see how this, this question can easily go to fatalism. Now, because we look around the world and, and where Proverbs says, hey, you know, look, you labor and you, and you gain from it. These Ecclesiastes often come and says, yes, but sometimes you labor and you don't gain from it. So the riddle of our time could lead to fatalism if it's wrongly considered, or it could lead to just a lot of worry. You meet a lot of Christian people, don't you, who worry about the time. And who worry that somehow they've gotten outside of the will of God. And that God had a plan for their lives and they're walking outside of that plan. You sometimes hear people talk that way. And, and they're, they're worried about the time. Um, what if I transgress the time? What if, what if I've missed my time for certain things? Right? What, what if, what if the, the time was there and it's passed me by? You think about that with relationships. What if... What if I had time to, you know, to embrace that person and I missed that time? And does that mean I've missed it forever? Did, did that, has that ship sailed? Has that train left the station? I mean, is it the case that there's just like one certain time for something? And if I don't hit the right time, I could miss it? 
That's the, the, the argument that, that is captured so famously in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar when Brutus is making his famous speech. He says, there is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and miseries. You see, that's his speech, right? There, there's a time when that ship set sail, set sail. And if you board the ship when it's time to set sail, you'll sail on to fortune. But if you miss it, what's going to happen? Your life is forever bound in shallows and miseries. And that, that can be the riddle of our times to say, you know, what, what if there's an appropriate time for something and I've missed it? Does that mean I've missed it entirely? And so that, that question, if he just left us there in verse 9, could lead to a lot of worry on the part of God's people or a lot of fatalism. Everything's determined. I can't do anything about anything. So why should I bother? Um, but Ecclesiastes is written so that we can answer the riddle of our times, not with fatalism or with worry but with remembering who's in control of our times. You see how he goes on, not just from the work that's being done, but to the God who's given the work to do. Verse 10 says, I have seen the business that God has given the children of man to be busy with. But God is in control of our times. That's the reason not to be fatalistic or worrisome about the times in which we live knowing that the world is in the control of our God. What we'll gain as a worker from his toil? It's the gain of knowing that it's God-given. And for the one who serves the Lord and, and keeps his commandments, this is a person who knows that the world is in the control of the hands who, it, it, the world is in the best hands it could be in. There's no one better to be in control. There's no one better to be appointing times and bringing times to pass than the Father in heaven who loves us. And that's why God's people should never greet the reality of our times and face that riddle of how we should live with fatalism or worry. Why? Because our times are in God's hands. The, the psalmist is so helpful to us. The psalms say in 56 verse 9, This I know, God is for me. The God who is establishing the times, who's appointed the times, that's the God who is for us. Our God. Or Psalm 31, verses 14 and 15. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Now, the, the riddle of our time has to be faced first with the acknowledgement that God's that everything is in God's hands. And not just that everything is in God's hands, that he's appointing the times and that he's bringing the times about by his sovereign will. But what also does the writer of Ecclesiastes go on to tell us in verse 11? He has made everything beautiful in its time. God is not just working, but God does all things well. He makes everything beautiful beautiful in its time. And so there's no reason for fatalism and no reason for worry when we confront the riddle of what do I have to gain from my work? I'm not in control of the time. It's a reminder that God is in control of the time. And, and that's the beginning of the answer to the riddle of our times. It doesn't answer all the questions. And it doesn't remove all the difficulty of life. Because that, that reminds us that God is in control of the world, but it sometimes doesn't help us with the further question that we sometimes ask, which is, what is he doing? Right? That, that we could be led to fatalism if, or worry if we just think, well, times are out of our hands, and we can be comforted that times are in God's hands. But sometimes we look at the times he's appointed and the times that he actually accomplishes things, and we say, why are you doing that now? Why is that the time now? So it doesn't completely answer the riddle of our time to say everything's in God's hands because sometimes we can't see what God's doing. And do you notice how Ecclesiastes is honest about that too? That's the very next thing he goes on to say. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart 
yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. The, knowing that God is in control of all things doesn't op- automatically you know, solve the riddle of our times because we still struggle with the question, what is God doing from beginning to the end? Clearly, he knows what he's doing. He makes everything beautiful in its time. And he's given us some understanding of eternity, that God has a plan that he's working from beginning to end, yet it's such that we can't see that plan. We can't gain the perspective to see how God is working and why God is doing what he's doing. Ecclesiastes tells us very clearly that God is a master craftsman. He's a master artisan. he's He's the great artist who takes everything from the beginning to the end of this world and makes it beautiful. God has a great, he's like a a great master artist working his masterpiece work. And it's the work that God is doing in this world from the beginning to the end. And if we could stand back and take it all in, we would recognize that God is such a master artist that nothing goes astray in all that he does from beginning to end. He's like no other master artist. I mean, think of the greatest painter in the world. Even the greatest painter must at some, now I don't know anything about art. I'm the least artistic person you will ever meet. But a real artist, I'm sure, they still have times where they make something they don't like. I'm sure that even if you're Picasso um, or, you know, Da Vinci, I'm sure there were things you crumpled up and threw away. You thought, that's no good. Why? Well, because there was something in the sketch you didn't like or something in the paint went astray. It was a brush stroke that was no good. It was a, it was a shade that was just off and it, it ruined the whole thing and it, you had to start over or cover it over or do something about it. Almost every artist probably has that. Or a sculptor nails, hits, hits the chisel and recognizes, oh, I messed that up. I need to cover that over or I need to start again. Almost every artist would have that. Making a tapestry, a stitch goes awry. Any artist knows something like that can go wrong. God is the kind of artist who he works from beginning to end, and there's nothing that goes wrong. There's not a brush stroke, brush stroke that's wrong in the entire artwork he's doing. There's not, there's not a chisel mark that goes astray. There's not a stray stitch in the fabric of what he's doing. Everything he does is beautiful. It's beautiful in its time, and it contributes to the wonder, wonderful work he is making of glory from beginning to end. That's the truth of what God has, is doing. God is a, is a master artist making a masterpiece in this world, taking what he created good and working until it's consummated in glory. And when that eternal work of God is done, going from the good of creation to the, to the glorious consummation of what he made. We will stand back and say, that's beautiful. And there was nothing in it that was unnecessary. Nothing in it that was a mistake. No eraser marks. It was exactly what he wanted, to, wanted it to be. And it was beautiful from beginning to end. And the riddle in our lives and what makes it difficult to live life in this world is we can't step back and gain the perspective that's necessary to see that masterpiece for what it is. We have spent, eternity has been set on our hearts, but so they cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. We're, in a sense, incapable now of getting the perspective we need to appreciate the masterpiece. But that's what God is doing. He's taking this creation that was subjected, that was created good, but subjected to futility. um, And bringing it to glory. That's what Paul tells us about the creation in Romans 8, 19 to 23. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That's so important. What does it teach us about this world? That sin has subjected man to death and man subjected creation to futility. 
put it in bondage to corruption, and we live our days in the futility of this creation that is eagerly waiting to be set free from its bondage. That bondage be that began when man fell into sin and brought death in the world, and the death that put this world in bondage to corruption, subjected it to futility. And the whole creation has been groaning, waiting to be set free from that. And, and the glorious good news is that that, that that beginning of freedom of creation has begun. Because think about how the order of things happened. Sin subjected man to death. Death subjected creation to futility. And what has the Son of God come in the world and done? He's rescued man from death. He's put an end to death by his own death on the cross. He's brought an end to sin. And he's raised from the dead. By his Father. He lives now. What is he a testimony to? This creation can be released. And he's the first sign of that release. The life of man come forth into the world. The promise is a harvest of mankind being raised from the world. And when man is restored, creation will be free. Right? That's the picture that Paul gives us here. The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for the resurrection of all of God's people, when it will be set free from bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Jesus has begun to free the world from futility begun to free the creation from its subjection. And all it's waiting is for its complete restoration and renewal when the Son of God returns in glory. Uh, there's a wonderful promise um, of that renewal, that consummated glory that will come when Jesus Christ returns in glory, raises the, Son of God, the sons of God to everlasting life, and creation is renewed in glory a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That is the masterpiece of what Jesus is, is doing in this world. That, that's the master artwork that God is doing from beginning to end, bringing the created order that was created good but subjected to futility and bringing it to consummated glory. And when we see what he's done from beginning to end, when we, when we go to glory and see that, we'll have the perspective to step back and say, that's beautiful. We'll have the perspective to say, you know, there was not one thing he did that was unnecessary to that work. There wasn't a brush stroke off. There wasn't a chisel mark that went astray. There wasn't a thread that was out of place in that tapestry. Everything is perfect. The problem of living our lives in this world is we're not yet there. The world hasn't yet been set free completely from futility. That consummation is not yet here. Jesus' saving work is finished, but his rene renewing work has not yet been consummated. It's not yet been fulfilled in glory. And so we live life in the midst of the creation that's still under corruption, that's still in futility, that still doesn't work as it ought to work because of the sin and death and futility that we brought into the world by our sin. And that's why so often things feel like they come to us out of time. Um, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die, but it never seems like death comes at the right time. People either die too young um, or when they are so old that someone might say it was a mercy that they died. There's a sense in which death can be a relief from a difficult life. But even when it puts an end to difficulty, we still don't greet it as a good thing in and of itself. We still never say, oh, well, isn't it good that they died? We say, we say, no, maybe death was preferable to the suffering that they were enduring in their living. But that doesn't solve the riddle of why wasn't it then a time of healing rather than a time of death? I mean, and that's the futility, that's the riddle with which we live in our time because we're still living in this, in this time of futility. 
And we don't yet have the eternal perspective to see why this is fitting. Um, when, we, when we gain an eternal perspective, we'll be able to see that what God has done has been good from beginning to end. But until that time when we can see that masterpiece from the perspective of eternity, it's hard for us to see what God is doing sometimes in the time to understand those things. Because we don't have the perspective. As Ecclesiastes says, we have eternity on our hearts, but we can't find out what he's done from beginning to end. We can't have the right perspective. And I think of it this way. If, if you can stand back and take the Mona Lisa in, you can see something of why it's a masterpiece. An artist could tell you better, an art historian could tell you better what makes the Mona Lisa a masterpiece. And it, it should be looked at from a certain distance, right? If you're too far away, you can't see any of the detail. It's hard to see what makes it a masterpiece. You have to be close enough to get the right perspective on it. But if you walked so close to the Mona Lisa that you almost had your nose touching it, you wouldn't be able to see anything about it. It would be too close to take it into view. And that's sometimes the struggle of living in this life. We're, we're so close to the things God is doing that we can't take a step back and get the eternal perspective we would need to see it, to really understand it. Or as another commentator put it, to use a different metaphor, it's almost like looking at the backside of a tapestry. And he says this, if we look at God's work, we can look at it like the reverse side of a tapestry with many confused lines and loose threads. And to seek to unravel it from our standpoint is to become involved in an endless labyrinth. The trouble for us is not that life refuses to keep still, but that we see only a fraction of its movement and of its subtle, intricate design. And we can think of that if we were there at the foot of the cross. Right? If, we, if we were there with that company that were faithful to our Lord and witnessed his death, we would be standing there and thinking, God cannot make this beautiful. This is horrible and awful. If anything is out of time and out of place, this is out of time and out of place because who's dying there? Someone who only ever loved God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength and loved his neighbor as himself. He never did anything but good to the people around him. And he was hated, he was plucked up, he was cast away, he was killed. And those who loved him looked on, unable to embrace him, weeping over him, mourning his death. And we would look at that situation and say, that's horrible. That's not right. This can't be the time for this. And his, his followers struggled. This, this can't be the time for this. And they must really have struggled with, how is this an appropriate end for the Son of God? And being so close to it, they must have said to that horror, have we ever seen a suffering like this? This can't be made right. This horror God cannot make beautiful. But God did make it beautiful in his time. Because with all the awfulness of the death of the Son of God, his death meant rebirth and life, not only for Jesus, but for all those he saved. There was a time to die, but there was also a time to rise from the dead. There was a time to die for his people and to raise them to life with him. There was a time for that war on the cross that has led to peace for us, for his slaughter that's led to our healing, for his love that's ended our hate. We now enjoy peace because of him. So if, all, if the horror and evil of that event God can make beautiful in his time. We shouldn't doubt that any horror God can make beautiful in his time.
So then briefly, what should our response to the times be? We can't fully resolve the riddle of our times as we live in the reality of our times. So how are we to respond to our times? Well, the preacher tells us what to do. I perceived in verse 12 that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and pl take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. It's a, it's a really interesting thing that we're, we're called to do. And I like how one commentator put it. The tension between today and forever in our lives cannot be completely resolved. Yet man can find forever in today by gratefully accepting the gifts of God and doing his commandments. How do we respond? We respond in three ways. We respond first by trusting God to take care of time and eternity. We trust God to take care of the times. We trust that he will make everything beautiful in his time, even if we can't understand how. We take heart from the fact that he is the one who's ordaining the times, the actual times and the appropriate times to produce the outcome of good and glory that he has planned. And we can trust him because as helpless as we are in controlling the times, we can trust in God's absolute power over time. That's what verses 14 and 15 so powerfully convey to us. We are powerless. God is powerful. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. We are absolutely not in control of our times. God is absolutely in control of our time. So let's trust him to take care of time and history. He's not subject to time. It's subject to him. When we meditate on that, we should, like the preacher here, uh, fear God. Be filled with that reverent fear for the God we have. Awestruck by his power. That in the, even the times are subject to him. Nothing happens apart from his sovereign appointment. And so we trust and we stand in awe and we rejoice. We say with Revelation 15, 3 and 4, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. So we trust to God to manage time and eternity, that's the first way we respond. The second way we respond are by enjoying his gifts today. Um, there's a sense in which because God is worried about the times, we don't need to be worried about them. We can enjoy today that God has given to us. Knowing that God is in charge of the big picture helps us to enjoy where we are today. How do we live in light of these realities? There's nothing better than to be joyful and do good as long as you live. Right? Rejoice and do good, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in his toil. That is God's gift to man. Because God is managing the times and manages all things well and makes all things beautiful, we can just enjoy what he's doing for us today. Rejoice and be good and do good. Celebrate the time we've been given by doing what pleases God and doing good works and gratitude for all he's done so enjoy his gifts don't let don't let the times be a reason not to enjoy today god has given us much to be thankful for today and especially on this lord's day this is a time for rejoicing this is a time to do good this is a time to be thankful for what god has done so we trust god to take care of time and eternity we enjoy god's gifts today and finally we hope in god's promise for tomorrow we rejoice in God's, we enjoy God's gifts today, and we hope in God's promises for tomorrow. It's hard to live in a world that's been subjected to futility. It's hard to live in a world that's still under bondage to corruption. Um, the beginning of freedom has come in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and freedom will come fully when he returns again in glory. Um, it's hard to live in a world that's been subjected to futility, but it's been subjected to futility, as Paul reminds us, in hope. It's been subjected 
in hope. And why? Because God will make it beautiful in time. We struggle because we can't see what God is doing from beginning to end now. But there's a time coming that we call the end in Scripture where the Lord Jesus will come in glory. He'll judge the living and the dead and he'll bring us into a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, in which all things are new. And then we will enter into the eternity of our God, where we will live with him forever. And on that day, we'll be able to stand back and see what he's done. We'll enter into the eternity of our God, living with him forever. And then we'll be able to have some sense of what he's done, the sense of glory in the masterpiece that he's given to us. Then we'll see. And then when we look at it, we'll stand amazed that there was not one thing that happened out of time. That it was all contributing to God's plan for the fullness of time to make things beautiful for his people. One day we will see it. We will see it and understand it. And so hope in that day when it comes and that we'll behold his glory. That's what Jesus wanted us to see, the glory. And some of the glory that he wants us to see is what he's been doing from beginning to end. When the end comes with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and we join the Father and the Son and the Spirit in glory and look back at the history that's been, we'll be able to say with the preacher, God has made everything beautiful in his time. So that's what we're to do. That's how we're to respond to the times in which we live. Let's respond to the fact that God is working for us in Christ even now and trust in him for his work. Enjoy the gifts that he's given and live in hope of the future that he's building and that we one day will see. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for this teaching on time that the preacher gives us in Ecclesiastes. We thank you for this understanding of of time, where we wrestle with the riddle of time, of why you appoint certain things when you do, why it comes to us at certain times to have to deal with life and death and the things in between. But how thankful we are to know that you are working to appoint all of those things, that all of us, come, all things come at your time, and that you make all things beautiful. Help us to, to be freed from fear, to trust you, to do all things well, to know that one day we will see what you've done and stand back and praise your name as the great God who's done it. But when we're standing too close to get that heavenly perspective on life, that eternal perspective that will reveal your work and your, and your good will for us, help us to trust in you. Help us to enjoy today, to enjoy the gifts that you've given to us today, the blessings that we have today, to eat and drink and be glad in the things that you've given. And if we're tempted to worry about tomorrow, to know that tomorrow you'll be in control then too. You, the God who are for us and showed how much you love us by sending your son into the world to save us from sins. Thank you that you are our God and that our times are in your hands. May we trust and hope in you. Hear our prayers, Lord, for we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been good to spend this morning with you, uh, to spend this time together opening God's word, and I want to leave you with God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. May he bless you today. May this be a day of rejoicing, uh, eating and drinking and being glad, doing good uh, in the Lord, knowing that the joy of the Lord is the strength of his people. And may he sustain you in that joy and in that strength until we meet again. Uh, we'll, we'll see you later this afternoon.